All right, I think we're going live. I think we're live to everybody. Everybody see me? Everybody hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> Good deal. There's a, there's a little delay on the YouTube channel from what we're getting, but. All we're right. Not. Anybody have any problems out there hearing, seeing? Just want to make sure before I start rattling on here. Perfect. Great. All right. Well, hello, minders out there and uh, Marty Owings fans. We're great to have you guys tuning in today. We've been looking forward to this. And um, Marty and I have been talking about this particular episode and live collaboration for probably a year now. And uh, I think we finally got around to doing it. So uh, Marty is a great tester, has tested a ton of supplies. I've I've gone to him uh, several times with questions, um, and I'm primarily a user. Um, and uh, we're going to kind of collaborate on that basis and see what we can get into here. Now, the first uh, topic that we're going to talk about is paints, uh, watercolor paints. Yeah. And Marty, uh, you have just uh, reviewed a ton of them, my friend. Yeah. And recently you did a video on the, your top five picks, and that was pretty interesting. It stimulated some great discussion. So I'll kick it off to you. What are you, your thoughts and yeah. since that video? <laughs> well, that start off right with the controversy because right there, if you try to do a top five video of anything, there's always going to be someone with uh, a different opinion or who doesn't share your same. I, I got a lot of feedback. I mean, that was the most commented video I think I've had in a couple of years and really? people are just, yeah. Oh yeah. People are super passionate about what types of watercolor they use, as you know. And, uh, so putting that out there was interesting. And I, I, people had been asking me to do it for a while. And I thought, you know what, Steve, it's just time we talk about what are, what are the favorite ones we use? And, and like I said, in the disclaimer in the opener of that, it's like my opinion, man, you know, yeah. <laughs> everybody's got one. So here's sure. the ones I just like to use. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, it, you know, what was interesting to me is uh, you brought up, I like the way you, you gave your top five, and uh, then you brought up uh, some others to kind of fill out a list of 10, then you had some honorable mentions. Yeah. And you had a lot of names in there, you know, that uh, I, quite frankly, hadn't thought of. And I'm sitting there going, hmm, not sure, you know, about that. And most of them I'd never laid hands on. So yeah. there, I, I you know, I think it's safe to say there are a ton of paints out there for the artist, ton of artist grade paints, yeah, and a ton of really, really great paints. And, hey, Steve, uh, I was th just thinking when you said that, as a watercolorist, do you then you just kind of find a paint you like and you tend to stick with it, or do you? Uh, I know you like to venture out a little outside of uh, uh, your comfort zone, but as a you know other watercolorists, is that the tendency? Yeah, um, and I I buy a lot more <laughs> I buy a lot more paint than than really I need to or should sure. because of my channel, and people ask questions and yet you know I have people ask me a ton about paints that I'll probably never get around to buying, mm -hmm. so uh, it's the usual way at least I think with professional painters we're talking about pa painters that that you know, do a lot of painting and they're, they're avid painters or they actually make their living off of it. Uh, they usually go with one brand, maybe two and fill out with three or four others. Some even shop by color. You know, okay. this brand has the best color here, the best color there, that sort of thing. Yeah. I keep all of my pigments um, segregated by palette just for testing purposes. Yeah. So that yeah, I like the way you're organized like that. You're very, uh, very yep, color oriented. So, and that's how you teach people to paint, which I ha I've just learned a ton from you. I'm yeah. not as organized as you are that way yet, but I like how you keep your, um, your palettes organized. And a lot of times I'll go and I'll go watch your channel and you'll do a video on a particular group of colors. Like I know you did that, uh, in the fall, you did some with, uh, the, um, Daniel Smith, the, the burnt orange. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Do you remember that? The and that Primatex. Was just, the Primatex. Was, was it yeah. Primatex? Okay. Yeah. 
Um, but I just had to go out and try those paints out, and I, I found them to be great. You know, yeah, so yeah. that was cool. Yeah. Well, and and like I say, uh, a lot a lot of artists don't do it that way with their palettes. I just do it for the channel's sake and for my viewers' sake. To, to keep it organized, but uh, I know Marty, you're a big uh, Schmincke fan. Yeah, tell me about that. How did you get to that? And uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I didn't put it in my my, my top five, and I think you you're noticed. killing me, man. You're <laughs> killing me with that. And, yeah, and I confess that's that's a lack of experience more than anything with the brand. But talk about it. So one of the things that you had mentioned was the grouping of colors and using different paints and stuff couple of these half pans that I use in my kit. This is the kit I take into the field with me when I paint. Um, this, this kit here has a couple of paints from uh, Daniel Smith because I know you were a big fan of Daniel Smith, and so I thought, well, I should try that paint. It's a good American company. Why not, right? So I've, I've tried a few, and frankly, I don't notice a huge difference in, okay. in Schmenka, which are very fine sort of precision and very consistent paints. Okay. Just as you would expect a German paint to be, right? Okay. It's just always get you, I'm going to get the same experience whether I buy a pan today or a pan 10 years from now. It just it's it seems like it's always the same. And I like that because then it gives a little bit of predictability uh, to my work when when you're a rookie uh, and you don't have a lot of watercolor experience, I, that helped me break into the medium and so okay. I like I, I just love the way that Schmincke manufactures their paints. I think mm. they invest a lot in quality. The way Karen Dosh does in their colored pencils. Sure. Or their watercolor pencils. So for me, Schmincke just came out on top as my mm. favorite brand because of that that consistency. And it's got all the right blends of things, you know, the the vibrancy and the uh, transparency. I can layer and glaze with these. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the way you do with the Daniel Smith, which okay. I need a little bit more practice with those, uh, yeah. to, to be honest. But that's yeah. that's one of the reasons I arrived. This that they ended up number one, and I, I just love these paints. They 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 don't sing uh, the way that a Sennelier does. You know, Sennelier just okay. Uh, it's like painting with poetry. You know, they were in my paints. top five. It's they were in your top. I noticed that, <laughs> and and you love your M Grams too. I we should yeah, my M Gram is number one for me. Yeah, yeah, right. And yeah. and I want to hear from you what you think, uh, why you put those number one. But certainly, you know, the debate could happen for the next hundred years, and I, I don't know really. When you get to the top three, Steve, uh, no, you know, I, 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 let's be honest. It, you get to the top ten, and right. you, you're probably fine. I mean, I think I mentioned to you in a comment. You know, if somebody said, you know, here's a set of Schmincke watercolors, and you can never use anything for the rest of your life. I, I die a happy man. So it's, <laughs> that's how little the difference we're talking. You'd be okay yeah. with that? Yeah. yeah, sure. So what? Why do why do M. Graham have such a, a a fondness for you in your heart? Why do you why do you gravitate to those? Yeah, um, I actually got into M. Graham by accident, or not accident, um, inadvertently. Our local uh, art supplier carries them, and that's their biggest line. Uh, they have uh, Windsor Newton, which, frankly, I have never liked Windsor Newton. I know some people swear by them, and I don't think their quality is bad, but, you know, I won't get into it. There's just a lot of reasons I don't use them much. Yeah. Um, they're overpriced, for one thing, here in the States. Um, but uh, so here was this other choice. At, and we don't have a lot of great uh, big art supply stores locally. Right. I could order them, but... Um, so I thought I would give a few a try. I, I, I've told people on the channel, I've, I've spent a good portion of my professional illustration life illustrating with artists, with um, student grade paints. Yeah. So when I finally realized, you know, the difference and how I really ought to kind of try to rebuild my, my paint stock, I decided to try these. And after doing that, I started researching them. And the more I researched about them, the more I found out they were like really tops um, in rating with a lot of artists. Then I went to the handprint site. Are you familiar with the handprint yes. site? Yes. Yes. Uh, along, he he kind of, um, although he didn't come out and say, you know, this is number one or anything like that. 
went with the single pigment colors, the consistency in manufacturing, the transparency, and other other, other factors. He ranked that with only a few. Yes. And so I thought, well, I'm on the right track. And uh, then last, it was either last year or a little over a year ago, I got to go hear Art Graham, the founder of the company. Yeah, you were, ta you were talking yeah. about that on your channel, yeah speak in person and i thought okay it's probably just going to be a promo and you know he's one of these ceos that just goes around kind of glad handing and talking about you know uh his his product sure not so man this guy had so much knowledge he shops personally shops for a lot of the pigments yeah and he he would go out and he used ultramarine as an example he goes out and he finds what he considers the best ultramarine blue pigment. Um, a lot of paint makers will go to a pigment supplier and get all their pigments, but he doesn't do that. And then just there was a room full of people, or probably 40 people, throwing all sorts of questions at him. And every question he had, uh, he just answered to my satisfaction. So I was very impressed. I got to meet him and talk to him afterwards. And <laughs> very knowledgeable man. Very knowledgeable. Well, it's man. what what a treat. Yeah, uh, yeah. So M Graham. Yeah, I I, uh, I I know you're a huge fan. They did. They they. I think they were sixth on my list of top ten. So they uh, that's still the top tier of paints. I, um, you know, you and I are are somewhat different when it comes to art supplies. As you you worked in the profession for years and years, and I'm. I was more or less a uh, you know hobbyist artist, but mm -hmm. one of the things that I, I like about like handprint, and I think you probably subscribe to this more than I do, is I think you love the the science of it, what's behind it. You know, you want to know that the paint's well made, it's going to last. I like those things too, but but somehow a paint has to just speak to me. You know, as sure. an artist, I I have to feel that poetry or that love for for the paint or the medium, and then I think it doesn't matter to me whether it was $500 for a half pan or, or five cents. Yeah. If, it, if it speaks to you, you know, you're willing to, to try to spend the money. And, I agree. Uh, and yeah. um, I eventually got to that with uh, M. Graham and their honey formulation. Um, one of the things I noticed is that you take a paint like uh, Windsor Newton and you try to fill a palette with it, uh, it gets hard, cracks, and falls out. So you're either left with having to buy their pans or find something. And one thing I loved about M. Graham is that it's sticky and it rewets much quicker yeah. than even Daniel Smith. So that was one of the things, I guess, that kind of spoke to me, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I understand, man, exactly what you're talking about. Um, and, you know, uh, Sennelier very similar i'm just well, going to ask you how do you compare those two because they're both they both have like honey in them right yeah so they do. yeah very rich um it just wet rewets almost instantly and um you know when you when you start painting you just immediately get a rich you don't have to sit there and uh, you know yeah i used to with some of the artists with some of the student grade paints that i used to use as an illustrator you just sit there i mean i would spray my palette with a spray bottle um, <laughs> a half an hour before I'd start painting. And then you sit there and you work and work the paint to loosen it up. You know, you don't have to do that with M. Graham or with Sennelier. And I have found Mission Gold kind of falls yeah. into that category too. That's right. We went uh, super fit. Not to get too far in the weeds on that topic, and I know we got to change over in a minute here, but what about like uh, – so you compared like M. Graham to Sennelier, and what what are the primary differences that you note that a painter might say? Well, okay, that's interesting. Or, um, I like uh, the transparency uh, a little better on M. Graham. Okay. Uh, than I do Sennelier, but I think some of that just comes down to hue. Uh, now, admittedly, I don't have much more than a pocket box on Sennelier. Okay. So uh, I can't say, you know, that there are huge differences um, in that regard even. But uh, uh, none other come to mind, really, other than one of the things I've, you know, I've always appreciated just through research is the consistency of their manufacturing and the high quality of their standards in that regard. 
You, you, but for so, both companies, or are you well, for for M. Graham, sure. I know less about Sennelier in that regard. Yeah. So. Well, Sennelier, you know, the, uh, the a chemist invented that paint, Gustave Sennelier. Yeah, in, over a hundred years ago or something. That's right. That's yeah. right. He was just messing around looking for a, a way to tint uh, some paints or something, and came up with a That's you know right. some, a good formula, and ended up. I I don't know when honey was introduced to the paint, but as I understand it, that wasn't initially a part of the watercolor, and, and you know because I I think even though artists were using watercolor a hundred years ago, um, a lot of it, that was considered like, like for oil painters to do a study with it. was you know, it's not like it wasn't yeah. a serious medium like it yeah. is today. Yeah. That, you're right. You're right. That's true. Well, well, let's move on Marty to the next topic and we're going to talk papers. Paper. Yes. <laughs> I love paper. Yeah, man. Um, you know, uh, got like a whole cabinet full of it over there. I'm telling you, <laughs> telling you what, um, you know, in boxes. <laughs> exactly right. I've got more paper than I would use in three lifetimes. Exactly. And yeah. I, I hate to admit that, and I still go out and buy a block every now and then. <laughs> um, but you gotta try the new stuff, right? You do. Yeah. You do, and then and then you see something you've got. Uh, set away and you say, hey, I haven't played it on that in a while. So well, let me well, do <laughs> that, that reminds me. Let's talk about that for a second because a new watercolor paint that uh, paper that just came out is the Legion Aqua uh, that Stonehenge. Aqua water, Stonehenge uh, made by Legion. And I thought to myself, you know what? Okay, I'll give it a try. They were sending out free samples. And <laughs> you know, I was surprised at that at that at that paper that it that it, it didn't buckle. And yeah. ripple, and uh, it, it's I, really. I amazing. laughed all the way through your video. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, but I was just remembering that you know it's a good thing to try new. That's a good reason to try new things because almost all the 140 pound water paper I have, and you know this, Steve, it will you'll get some buckling and turning and you know, sure. on the paper, sure. and that stuff just seems to lay flat. I mean, better than it will buckle if you. Yeah, you know, spray it with a fire hose, but eventually, yeah. you know, it seems to settle back down. Yeah, I um, I am very, very excited about that paper. Uh, I'm kind of trying to hold back my excitement because you know, kid, new kids on the block, right? Can yeah. sometimes disappoint you. I, I feel the same way about Mission Gold. Uh, when you know, not to digress back to paint, but when I started reviewing that and using that, I thought this paint really can't be this good. And, you know, there are criticisms out there about flow and light fastness. And a lot of those supposedly have been solved. Well, it's the same way with Stonehenge Aqua. And uh, I've painted on the cold press, um, paint, doing a painting now on the hot press. And, oh, my goodness. I mean, just uh, the way I rate a paper, a new paper when I'm trying it, is that it doesn't, it doesn't, get my attention because usually if a paper gets your attention it's it's something bad pretty it's good like right you, yeah right. you put a, a color down and you say oh i didn't want that to happen or oh <laughs> yeah. man that's stained and now i can't lift it or oh stink you know that that wash is not flowing the way i wanted it to right you know arches i mean or arch depending on how you pronounce it let's crown them the the king right away uh all you have to do is look through a volume of splash to see that 90 percent of the artists in there use arches that's so, your favorite paper yeah right steve yeah yeah yep. yeah it's predictable i know exactly what i'm getting i know exactly what's going to happen when i paint with it and i know what i can do i know it, it's robust it's it holds up to punishment uh, you can do a lot of correcting with it um it's just a known entity and um one of the things that's impressed me about Stonehenge is yeah. uh, the first time I painted on it, I forgot I was painting on Stonehenge. I thought, oh, wow, the, that's right. I'm, this is Stonehenge Aqua. Yeah, I think you mentioned that in your video. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I had the, all the correction I needed. I had all the, the or expected. You, know, you never have all you need. But right. um, those kind of thoughts, and I thought, wow. Uh, you know, time will tell, but so far this is impressive. What, so have what, you painted on it at all? Uh, arches, yes. I have, you know, a, 
I have it in all its various weights. Uh, Arches has a new paper out recently. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, it's for a different type of medium, uh, oil painting. Maybe that's been around for oh, yeah. a long time, but the I've been wanting painting. to. Yeah, I've been wanting to test that out and use okay. it. But one of the videos that you did, um, it was either last year or the year before, was like, how do you stretch paper? And I remember one of your key points at the end of that video was like, you, you know, you don't have to get exp you don't have to buy an expensive stretcher and right. try to get all crazy with this stuff. And as me, as a sketcher or plein, plein air painter, I, I, I don't want to bring a big board and an apparatus out in the field with me. The smaller, the better, right. you know, because I, yeah. I got to tote this stuff through woods or urban landscapes or wherever I am. But what what key points do you think uh, or what feedback did you get from users out there that they want to know about, like, how to keep paper, watercolor paper flat or whatnot? Um, yeah, it uh, stretching is never necessary. Uh, people are kind of shocked when I say that. There are some artists who feel like they absolutely must. I mean, okay. they have to. And it, it, it's never necessary. It's all about how well you can tolerate and paint with the peaks and valleys in the buckling. Um, and usually, you know, obviously, people who paint on 300 pound will know that you don't have to stretch that. But the 140 pound, usually there's not a problem with 140 pound unless you're talking about a, a fairly big size painting, fairly big size sheet, like a, a a half sheet or maybe slightly less than that, or full sheet. Some people paint on full sheets. Sure. So yeah. in terms of it being flat, um, it's just all your tolerance. Uh, you know, if you're the bigger the the surface you're painting on, um, the more likely and the more water. That's the other thing. If you use yeah. a lot of water, you're going to get the more buckling, the more saturated that paper is. And then it's just a matter of, of can I do this painting uh, with all the peaks and valleys? Uh, <laughs> if you're trying for a really smooth sky, you may have a trouble because the pigment's going to settle in those valleys. And as I said, there are, there are artists out there that are just obsessive about stretching their paper. They want it. Mm -hmm. Tight as a drum. I was even watching a video or one. Yeah, I think the link is in my stretching video description. She puts it on a canvas stretcher, uh, gets it soaking wet, staples it to canvas stretcher, and then you can actually stretch the canvas. She and you know she thumps it once she's done, and it's tight as a drum. And she doesn't like the least bit of, of slack or uh, buckling. So I'm not that way. You know, I don't. And I do stretch on occasion uh, if it's something I think that might matter a little bit, but you don't ever need to stretch. Okay. Two other two other things on paper that I was going to ask you about, and hope you can share this with the uh, viewers, but one of the things was, you, you know, um, we were talking about, like, sketchbooks and how, and how there's really no 300-pound paper in a sketchbook. It's hard to bind that. It's hard to do stuff like that. But... As a sketcher, I like heavy duty paper. I use the Stillman and Burns sketchbooks, as you know, and uh, they're a favorite of mine. But mine too. Um, it, yeah, it, right. Anything that's like cardstock, you know, I kind of like being able to yeah. sketch and paint on that and rework yeah. it because you could use like a multitude of mediums. When I'm out sketching, I might use marker, ink, pencil, sure. charcoal, watercolor. Yeah. Um, uh, same as you. You you did on your Fort Sumner video. I I think you used might have used some ink and fountain pen. Water. Yeah fountain yeah. pen but um when you're when you're using that i, I want a sketchbook company stillman and burn legion whoever it is to at least get me up to like 140 pound paper bound in a really good sketch yeah yeah that would be nice it would um and 300 would be ideal yeah you can only get five pages It'd probably be sketchbook. about that thick <laughs> right? Yeah. right that's the prohibitive uh, <laughs> part to that yeah, and the other thing too, uh, the weight. But the other thing is the uh, the cotton content is usually not there with sketchbooks, and that just affects. Uh, it's essentially, you're painting on lower grade paper. You stole even with, my thunder because I was going to ask you about because so you like a hundred hundred percent cotton paper, and so do I. Well, it's totally, and, yeah. totally different painting experience. Totally different. What? Um, and it depends. Uh, I would say it depends on how you paint. You know, 
Um, there are some people that, that do a la prima, and a la prima just means all at once or all in one sitting. Uh, they yeah. don't do a lot of layering. And layering is very, very difficult in a non-cotton paper, uh, layering and glazing, um, because it loosens up, you know, and then depending on how uh, you like to do wet and wet washes, um, if you don't do a lot of them when you're you're sketching in a journal, you're yeah. going to be better off. Wet and wet washes don't act and don't dry as evenly as they do on cotton paper. So it's just mm -hmm. things that kind of relate to uh, your, you know, your painting style. And, and it's yeah. going to last on 100% cotton paper because we've got examples from the 17, 1800s where those paintings, drawings, illustrations still exist. Even going back to Leonardo da Vinci's time, you know, right. if it's on... I don't know if there was some mix of uh, uh, animal type vellum back then and cotton paper, but uh, the hundred percent cotton paper seems to hold up over time pretty well. Right, right. Not that we'll ever care about that, but uh, that's right. <laughs> but uh, but somebody might, you know. Yeah, you know, and the other thing is, uh, I have beginners all the time um, asking me. Is there a cheaper paper I can paint on? You know, is there a cheaper paper I can paint on? Here's the problem is, is that cheaper paper is harder to paint on for a beginner. Yeah, you've said you that. You actually have to be more experienced and and better in control of your paint and water to paint on cheap paper than you do on cotton paper. That's that's the rub. And, it, you know, it should you would think it's the other way around, but it's it's not. And um, that's why I tell them, look, if you, you know, it's like I used to be in, uh, really involved in astronomy. And, um, you know, a cheap telescope like you buy at a, at a department store. Like a Tasco or? Yeah, you're going to draw, you're, you're going to be so disappointed and, you know, disillusioned with the idea of astronomy that you, you're never going to pull it out again. Okay. But who, what beginner or student wants to go out and spend nine hundred, you know, a thousand dollars on a good telescope? Right. So that's kind of an over-the-top illustration. But you get the point. No, no, it's a very good point because I, I make this a lot on my channel. Like somebody will say, "Hey, you know, the Faber-Castell polychromos pencil is expensive. I can go with the cheaper pencil, or I could use, um, you know." A brand I shouldn't even mention them, but you know Prisma Colors. They were great back in the day. My dad loved them. They're not so great anymore, but you know you can save a few bucks. And yeah. my thing is, yeah, you could save a few bucks, but you're not going to be as happy with the outcome of your work. Yeah. I'd rather save another week uh, and buy uh, and buy that that Polychromos pencil than I would have two or three of the cheap cheap pencils. Now, every once in a while, uh, a pencil will surprise you. Um, you know, Blick makes these okay. pencils made in the Czech Republic. They're the same as the Koinor colored pencils, and mm -hmm. they're really good. They're, they're pretty nice. They're wax-based. They got a clay wax mixture, um, hmm. and they're really, really a nice pencil. But the Polychromos and the Caran d'Ache pencils, they cost more because they put more into them. They, okay. The quality's better. The the shafts, uh, the the casings don't break. Yeah. The pores are a little bit thicker. You know, you get more mileage out of a pencil, like yeah. that, out of a beautiful pencil. So I, I have a stack of them here, and they're not cheap. I mean, you know, one box of these, Steve, and I'll just show you here on my uh, – a box of these babies will run you about half a car payment, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, – but these are some of the best pencils in the world if you're talking about a watercolor pencil. And, cool. I mean, uh, Karen, Karen Dosh doesn't pay us to say this stuff. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, these oh, are I precious. believe it. I Look at them. It. I should put these in a vault, Steve. I know, right? You don't want to right. use them. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're hardly worn down at all, you know. Buy a I set to look to at and buy a set to use. Right. <laughs> I need to use them. But uh, the whole point is just that it, it, it makes – it makes sense, as you say, to spend a little bit more and be a little bit more satisfied than, than to, than to buy something cheap. And 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 if yeah. you're a beginner, like I tell people, if you're a beginner and you use something cheap and you're disappointed, you it may discourage you from doing. Yeah, you know, now you're stealing my thunder. Yeah, that was exactly the point. You know, it's like um, if you 
if you get out a piece of paper and you try to learn the very first basics of watercolor and you fail, which is easy to do on cheap paper, right. uh, you may abandon it right then and there. You know, it, it, so paper is always the first supply, first art supply for watercolor that I suggest people spend their money on. You can actually skimp on brushes, you can skimp on paint, but never skimp on the paper if you're a beginner. Yeah. That's and, and always Steve, been my what, what, advice. What I mean, you can go out, you, I mean, people think they have to go out and get a ream of watercolor paper to start. You get a few sheets, uh, you could, and now with the, uh, the great uh, democratization of the internet, you could just go out and buy a few sheets online and they'll mail it to you and, uh, you know, Bob's your uncle, yeah, right? How much is that that uh, that uh, book of arches right there? This is a tear off pad, and it, effectively, this is what I use as my practice pad. Yeah. Um, I can get this at Hobby Lobby with my phone app coupon any day of the week for forty percent off. So okay. it's going to cost me about twelve bucks. Hundred yeah. percent cotton. Um, it is. Uh, I think a machine made as, as opposed to their full sheets are like mold made, right. but they act, it acts exactly the same. This is a high grade paper. Um, you can paint on both sides for practice. You know, I can cut yeah. one of these if I'm practicing, I can cut one of these. It's a, it's a nine by 12 sheet. I can cut it into four squares and do four little paintings. If I'm just trying out a technique then I can turn those over and paint on the other side. You never need, you know, unless you're just poor as a church mouse. Well, you, know, you probably shouldn't be in the art field anyway. <laughs> well, and it's uh, and and it's the cost of like uh, three lattes. So just uh, you know, skip your visit to Starbucks that day and yeah. or that week, and you can buy it. But uh, the the point of it is, and there there is an economics to it, you know. And I understand that a lot of people are on a a stretch budget or what have you and I, I i review a lot of pencils art materials paints that 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 are less expensive and more economy based and for the budget minded mm -hmm. artist or whatever and, you know and this is what i like to tell my channel subscribers they, they call uh, they'll they'll leave a comment or a question for me about what is the very you know what is the very best thing i should use to have my art improve and the thing if it is you know, like the humble number two pencil, you know, start, start there. Yeah. You know, that, that's where I started. And I think if, if you, if you're afraid on one hand to just, you know, throw caution to the wind, I yeah. mean, there's people out there, Steve, you know, this, that just collect art supplies. I mean, right. do, do you use them? I mean, right. that's the whole point of buying them. You got to use them. Right. I mean, right. I have a collection of Co Co Copic markers down here. Let me show you, Steve. <laughs> Look, see two boxes of them, right? Yeah, yeah. I need to use those babies. They they stare at me, they mock me, and some days oh, I, I look at them and they they're like, I'm mad that I don't use them more. But, you I know. know, man. I hear a mocking from here, and you probably can, <laughs> and you can probably hear some of mine too. I've got, I've got a bunch of stuff that I don't really use. Um, but yeah, no, absolutely. You're you're right. Um, I, I do want to. I know we're going long on this subject, but. There are brands out there other than Arches, and um, one thing I know that I get complaints uh, a lot are people overseas, depending on what country they're in, uh, Arches, for instance, is extremely expensive in some countries, and it's just really not uh, usable, you know. It doesn't make any economic sense. No, it doesn't make any economic sense, and we're kind of blessed here that we can get it pretty cheap. Um, but there are other good brands. If you're in the UK, uh, I don't know what the cost is, but Saunders Waterford, fantastic paper. Yeah, not arches, it, but it's a really good paper. And they um, used to make like a Buckingford. Uh, Buckingford is their next grade down. Okay. Um, okay. But Saunders Waterford is like their top, 100% uh, cotton paper. I have some blocks of it. I like painting on it. Sure. Uh, you know, Erwin Leon, the guy that did the perfect sketchbook. His first uh, version, his little pocket one, was all Saunders Waterford. Okay. So it's a good one. If if you're in, and I would assume, I don't know, but I would assume if you're in the UK, that's that's going to be readily available. Yeah. Uh, hey, you were, I was thinking of your uh, Sumpner. 
your Fort Sumter trip. Yeah, Fort Sumter. Yeah. Yeah, Fort Sumter. And you, 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 and this is cool. What you do sometimes, I just think, is really cool. And you'll go out and you'll find like there's a a GoFundMe or a Kickstarter, and you'll find some dude who's making a sketchbook in his basement or garage, and you'll buy that. You'll help fund that. Or and they find it, me. <laughs> or they find you, and you use it. And and I think that's really neat. Steve, talk about that guy. The sketchbook Irwin, guy. Yeah, Erwin Leon, um, yeah. the perfect sketchbook. Just That was just one of the high points so far of my channel was yeah. was meeting him. I never haven't met him in person, but he's a great artist. He travels a lot. I think he's, I'm not sure, and Erwin, if you ever see this, I apologize if I'm wrong. I think he's based in Singapore okay. or somewhere, Hong Kong maybe somewhere. Uh, uh, I think he, he came to school over here in the states uh but a fantastic artist just he just decided and he did a, did a lot of travel sketching and uh he just decided he was not going to do all that with anything less than the best so he he's actually done three campaigns now uh he did a fourth that he rejected a different size he started out with this the perfect sketchbook pocket it was about this big and that was, uh, as I mentioned, Saunders Waterford. I think it's like 90 pound stuff. It's kind of a cream color, beautiful yeah. paper. Good for mixed uh, media? Yeah, it is. Um, it, I think it is. Uh, I, James Gurney, I think, uses his books. Um, okay. And then he went to uh, a bigger size, which he rejected for some reason. Then he ended up with the B5. Um, let me grab one. Yeah. Yeah, well, you're grabbing that. I just, I, I see there's these people that are doing sort of niche stuff on their own, whether it's a watercolor kit, a homemade watercolor. That. No worries. But I was just, I was just mentioning there's people doing niche stuff out there, like one-offs, like these sketchbooks or a or a watercolor kit or what have you. Yeah, yes. there it is. Yeah, this is the B5. Yeah. Um, I backed him on Indiegogo for two of these, and he sent me one in addition with my. My name on it. Yeah, nice. Um, and I kind of broke this in when I took my trip to Charleston uh, last year. Yeah, um, I remember some of these sketches. Yeah, oh, they're beautiful. And it's just, you know, what, what more could you want than pulling out a sketchbook and painting on high quality, real, what I call real watercolor right, paper? Right, yeah. So. It's beautiful, and he yeah, sold all of those. Yeah. And then just this year, he did a new campaign uh, of a signed and numbered series of nine hundred. Yeah. And I didn't need one, but I bought another one. So uh, just beautiful, beautiful sketchbook, well, and that's the guy. We got to switch gears to studio, but before we do that, I want to ask you about uh, Fabriano uh, paper. That was the other one I was yeah. going to mention. If you're in Europe, you live in Europe, check into Fabriano. It's affordable, right? Italian yeah. paper. Haven't and they I, been making it since like 1100 AD or something like that, right? It's 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 like 800 years they've been making that paper. Almost as long, long as Arches. Arches is the only one that's been making it longer. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I would say ne next to Arches – that's probably one of the most used brands. I'm not sure why. I think they probably are on par with Saunders Waterford. Um, yeah. There are just slightly different characteristics that people like. I, I find that Fabriano Artistico lifts a little easier than Arches. Yeah. And some people like that. If you get into heavy glazing, you're not going to like that. But it's it, it's a beautiful paper. And um, actually now the B5s are done with that paper. Um, so uh, the 90 pound version of that. So if you're in Germany, you might, and I don't know anything about this paper. I'm getting some samples to try. If you're in Germany, you might want to try Hannemule. Well, I've um, tried that. Have you? Awesome. What do you think? I got it in sketchbooks uh, from wet paint. And let me tell you, it's spectacular. There's cool. another sketchbook paper uh, from Germany called Kunst and Papier. Okay. And that's a good sketchbook. I've, I've got it too. But to me, the paper's a little thin, but the Hannah Mule, uh, I I loved it. It's, it's very durable pages, a little bit pricey for folks in the state, but okay. uh, folks over at Wet Paint helped me out, and I, I got to try out a few, and they're pretty 
pretty top notch, Steve. You, I'm gonna, I, you're gonna I'm enjoy gonna it. try it uh, yeah. soon. I'm getting some samples sent to me, but uh, yeah, and um, uh, there was another one on the tip of my brain that I was I was gonna mention. It wasn't Moleskine because I know you don't really uh, you're not a fan like I'm. I'm not a big big fan of Moleskine. Okay. Yeah, I and I've never. I ha actually have one, uh, a sketchbook, but I've not done anything in it. Sits, you don't use it? <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, let's transition into studio and plain air. Okay. Because we probably only have realistically 10 minutes left to cover, and then we got to get to Q&A. Right. So you're, you, 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 you do both. You're both studio and plain air guy. Um, yeah, actually, you were the one that inspired me to do more plain air. I don't. I I find that hard to believe. Since no, uh, well, what it was is your your uh, your adventures. Oh, your the art, art adventures. Yeah, I didn't know you from from Adam, and I started watching your channel, and I thought, wow, this looks like fun. And he's made a video out of it, and I think you had gone to a park. Was the first one I saw. It was like in the dead of winter, practically. Yeah. And then you did one on Mount Rushmore yeah. and a trip you took or something. And then you kept doing these. And I thought, oh, I'm, and you may even remember the comment I left on your channel. I thought, I'm going to steal this, Marty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, <laughs> uh, and you're much more, uh, to be honest, you're more entertaining. I mean, my oh. adventure videos have been called like low budget PBS radio. So <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be better if I just, just filmed, but. I, I have a lot yeah. of fun doing it, but yeah, yeah. you, uh, I, from the first time you did one and I think it was just a short, you just took a short trip, but all your video work and your cuts and that you, you really were efficient in the video and I don't want to get into the weeds on that, but it was very entertaining. Yeah. Well, you know, in the end, I think, uh, it's, it's who you can inspire to get out their paints and their brushes and paint. And that's really all that matters. Um, I tug, told old dime, uh, old blind Doug um, yes. that that's one of the reasons I like his channel so much is that he robs you completely robs you of your excuses. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> and you just you know you see him doing it, you think I yeah I better get out there and paint something, yeah. right? And so yeah. that that was kind of where that that came from. And I I really had no plain air experience. I, back in college, I did some, um, but since then, nada. And uh, so, yeah, you know, you're definitely the inspiration for getting me back on that track. Well, well, if I inspired one guy, I'm pretty happy that it was you. But uh, yeah, it's great. It's great to watch your videos. And the Fort Sumner video was particularly interesting to me because you, you captured the three main ele elements and you stayed entertaining. So, you, so you've got good subject matter, Right, you got a talented artist, and, and then and then you kind of explain what you're doing yeah. in the video, which to me yeah. hits on kind of all the high points, which was pretty cool. And you've done a, a number of others that I that I think people should just go after after we get done here, just go through Steve's channel and and check out some of his um, art adventure videos. They're well, pretty, good. pretty fun. I'm glad you like those. It, there's still a lot about it that's uncomfortable, um, and I, you know. How do you find that? I know you you go with a lot of these groups. Yeah. And I know you're you're uh, from your videos, you're peering over their shoulders a lot. And <laughs> thankfully I haven't had too many people doing that, but <laughs> well, sometimes I feel like uh they might be a little uncomfortable that I'm doing that cuz uh, there's a bit of voyeurism there, right? Cuz when an art <laughs> artist is doing his process and then all of a sudden he looks up and there's old Marty staring at him with a, a GoPro. But yeah. uh, I try to ask permission in advance, and unless yeah. they're really good friends of mine, I'll I'll be uh, I'll be more yeah. deliberate about asking them. But so I find it I find it comfortable. My, this is my go away face. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's uh, I'm I'm kind of uh, indifferent to that. You know, I, I'm just like I'm I'm, I'm, like, I'm there to tell the story, and. Uh, <laughs> You should see some of the work, though. Like, like some artists are very solitary and introverted. Yeah. Even yeah. though it took them a hell of a lot to step out of their comfort zone and get out in the field, yeah. we'll go as a group, and occasionally we'll have uh, like a friend of mine join me or whatever. That like Kurt Schulzettenberg. He's a 
he's kind of an introverted guy. He's not much of a talker. But we took a trip recently out to the Eagle Center in Wabasha, Minnesota, and we did some painting. He's an extraordinary painter of birds and cool. nature. And uh, and we were out there, and I was filming him, and I could no- I noticed that through his body language, he's a little self-conscious about it, you know. Yeah. And you know, and I'm I'm like, hey, relax, Kurt. It's no big deal. It's just it's just going to be seen by twenty thousand people on the channel, <laughs> you That's know. Right. But but it just just adds a little bit yeah. to his nervousness. But just breaking the tension. It's the people, the ordinary people. Like my favorite moments being out sketching, and I don't know if this is true with you, Steve, is when a kid, a little kid, comes up who's interested in art, and asks yeah. you, you know, asks yeah. you questions, and and because their questions are so unvarnished, they don't. They don't know what a bad question is, so they'll ask you anything, you know, about okay. art or whatever. And it's just nice to to share back with them, you know. Hey, keep keep yeah. keep working at it, you know. Okay. Take your stuff out. That's neat. That's neat. Well, let's. Uh, I don't know if we've got time for brushes or not. Um, well, we let can... me just do this. Even if we don't have time, we'll just get right to the best right now. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, there is a big quill. I mean, I oh, mean, yeah, man. human beings, you know, it's nuns, right? You know, they, it's a, I, I picture a monastery. No, I, I know, but this is a story I made up in my head. <laughs> it's a monastery, and, and you have, or, or whatever they call a nunnery, but you have to spend like 10 years. This is the truth, though. You have to spend 10 years apprenticing to make these brushes before hmm. you're allowed to hand make a brush from beginning to end. I read that about uh, okay. Isabe and, and made it yeah. in in in, a, in the French countryside, right? Yeah. Wow. Don't have any Isabes. I have uh, some Raphael's, some um, Rosemary's, um, but you know, it's probably no surprise that people watch my channel regularly. The silver brush black velvets are my favorite. Yes. Um, yeah. it, Good brushes. Yeah, and let me just take this opportunity to answer a question really quick yeah that i get time and time and time again um unlike paper you don't have to spend a lot on brushes um you can because there's some expensive ones out you can spend 300 yeah. dollars on a single brush and you don't need to do it they no. they literally don't really help you paint that much better it's kind of like you were talking about with with color you know, there's some things that just speak to you when you paint. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're a beginner, you're not going to know enough about painting to know, you know, what those things are. And so I get the question all the time, uh, what's a cheap brush that I can start with? And the simple answer is gold and Teclon. Um, there are probably dozens or maybe hundreds of manufacturers, and uh, it's a synthetic brush. Um, it's not as cheap as like the the pure white you know the pure white synthetics like you use yes. for crafts but uh, they hold water well yeah, yeah the, they yeah. do and you will pay varying amounts for them depending on the grade and the maker mm -hmm. uh like here in the states hobby lobby has their own master's touch brand and you know half the time if you wait for the sale you can get them half price and right. they're cheap like super cheap that's fine. A golden tackle on this is a Grumbacher Golden Edge. Yeah. So this is one of the better, uh, probably golden tackle on brushes out there. Um, and Windsor and Newton make a line too, I think, of the. Yeah, they do. And this is probably my favorite synthetic is the Da Vinci oh, uh, yeah. Cosmo Top Spin. Yeah. Pretty and nice. This is a, yeah, it's a really well made uh, golden tackle on type. Um, but you don't have to even pay this much for them as long as you get one uh that holds a good point um you can usually have something that's good enough to start with and i always tell people uh start with three rounds like a a four and eight and a ten or four and eight and a twelve yeah and what you're um, talking about right now is, is the designation of the brush tip base the round yes yeah, sorry yeah. no yeah. no just because, because I mean, I I watched this guy paint uh, the other day. Uh, his name is uh, was it Alvaro Castagneda or whatever. Yeah. I don't know how to say his last name, but he he started out with a with a paintbrush you'd get at Menards or or, or Home Depot. You yeah. know, like a a square paint, right? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like you paint and yep. trim with. Yep. And he just 
he's like washing the the paint across the paper and or you know and the color and wetting things down and making big lines like that he works big but uh you different brushes for different uh functions on the paper yeah there. yeah yeah i love alvaro he's he's amazing he's kind of a showman um yeah but he's he's fantastic yeah no um yeah i was i was referring to the size you're you're absolutely right and you don't need flats you don't need riggers you don't need um fan brushes to start you just start out with a round you know yeah a couple three sizes like this and it'll get you painting and i know uh, it's I, uh, no go ahead steve Oh, I was just gonna say, back off on one brush. If you were planning on buying four brushes, back off on one and spend that money on paper. Yeah, well, I, it might be blasphemy to mention this, but in because uh, we're we're talking watercolor, but as an oil painter, I I do use the flats quite a bit. You know, I like I like the flats because I'm carving the paint as I'm yeah. going along. You know, different from uh, watercolor a little bit. So, but you but you're experienced enough to know why you like them and what well, to yeah. do with them. You know, it's been 50 and, years, so took and me a I, there are a lot of beginners out there that think, Oh man, I need I need three rounds, I need at least right. four or five flats, I need wow. uh, uh, a rigger, I need you know, and those things are great eventually, yeah, you know, once you gain some experience. But to begin with, what's your schedule like? Uh, can you run a little over if we take some QA here? Uh, Steve, yeah, are you good? I, with that? I absolutely can. Okay. Did you want to go right to that now or? Well, one you thing want I wanted to mention before we and I I do because I want to go pretty quick because a lot of people have been waiting patiently and I know they got a lot of questions, but people always ask me, what do you take in the field? Oh yeah. I got this old Jan Sport backpack that I take most of the time with me. It's got kind of a, a reinforced bottom, you know, with a rubber bottom. So if it's wet, I can set it down and my paper's not gonna get oh, mangled inside. It's got good some too. pockets here yeah. on the outside. Um, and then on the inside. I usually just have a couple of different sketchbooks. You know, I just take out. You know, this is a got a it's a toned paper sketchbook. Okay. Utrecht used to make these, and I don't know they quit making them, but they were awesome. Uh, and then I'll usually bring a small Stillman and Burn sketchbook with me. You know. Okay. Uh, and then basically, I've got some some uh, some ink pens, some pencils, and I've got my watercolor kit. And uh, if I'm going to do anything with markers, I'll bring some Faber-Castell uh, pit markers with me. It's hard to see through the bag, isn't it? I forgot about that. But there's a, you know, I have to have every color in the universe when I go out, Steve, just because yeah. I might be missing, you know, periwinkle or yeah. something like that. You know because I mean? they mock you if you don't. They do. So I take it with me, and maybe I only use four or five of them. Yeah. But, uh, the point is you don't need a lot to go out. Right. I know that uh, – a friend of mine named Lynn Pauly, she goes out sketching with me a lot, and she just puts what she needs in her handbag, a sketchbook, a little miniature watercolor kit from a mint tin, you know, uh, like, uh, yeah. what is the yeah. Curiously, uh, whatever, whoever makes those mints. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, I she's, forget. she's got this little mint kit, and then she's converted it to a paint Altoids. kit. Altoids. Yeah, Altoids, and she's yeah. got this little collapsible brush, and that's all. You know what? You don't need all kinds of fancy equipment no. to be uh, no. uh, to have fun and go right. out and, and right. have a good time. But and yeah. I, and one thing I wanted to mention on that that score is take just a pencil if that's all you feel comfortable doing. Take just a pencil and a sketchbook and paint back in the studio. I was um, going to say that, Steve. You know, you because you, you do it full time as a living, but I I don't. I have a day job, and oftentimes all I'll have is a a blue ballpoint pen with me and my oh. my work notebook and i'll just doodle all day in my work notebook there you, you know, go uh, you know if i'm in a boring meeting yeah don't tell the corporate captains i said that but <laughs> yeah uh, if it's another meeting on six sigma ah uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> i just want to sketch but yeah there you go yeah yeah so q a yeah, let's take some questions and uh, let's see. I'm gonna just if you see any uh, that you want to answer, go right ahead, oh, Marty. Here, Steve. Well, what like like uh, Diane Nips is asking, what does your plain air kit look like, Steve? Um, <laughs> I have about five to six variations because 
I am so experienced with plain air, I keep changing it. Um, okay. I have uh, most things I've been, this is my latest iteration of the utensils. Um, and I can put a number of things in here. Uh, the silver things in the middle are travel brushes. Over here, you can see the um, microns. microns, bigger microns. Yeah. Yeah. I've got, and it depends on what mood I'm in when I take some, I may add a uh, fountain pen to this. Hey, I've do you got, have uh, a, a Uniball uh, 152, a UM 152 white pen in there? I, uh, it's a, it's a jelly roll gel jelly pen. Roll? Okay. Yeah. And I have, but I do have a Uniball Vision Elite. It's a very oh, fine nice. uh, pen and it's waterproof. Oh, no, you can't get washes with that ink. Okay, gotcha. Right, right. Gotcha. This is uh, something I've been experimenting with. This uh, this is a zebra uh, okay. brush pen, but it's not one of the the real brushes. It's sort of a rubbery Oh, tip. sure. Yeah. Okay. So I like that. Sometimes I'll take uh, the one that is a real brush, and I don't have it anywhere near... But uh, it depends, you know, to answer the question, it depends on how light I'm trying to travel. I've got a backpack similar to yours, uh, Marty. Yeah. That I can put uh, a fairly large palette in. Um, I can actually put an easel. I built an easel. Um, yeah. Some of you have seen my video on that that attaches to a tripod. Um, and I can even put a block, a watercolor block in there or any nice. number. A lot of times I'll take this. Um, however, yeah. for lighter traveling, I have this this uh, bag over here. Hold one second. Yeah. This. Oh, sure. Yeah. Like a satchel. Yeah, it's yeah. real Bike small. Bag. It's just a sling bag. Yeah. And I can yeah. put a small journal in here. Uh, usually we'll try to fit my little Sennelier pocket box and I can put this or I can just take a few of these utensils out and put it in here. So I, I'm i still messing around yeah. with how I do it and what I like to do and sure. inevitably, you know, get out in the field and say, oh man, I wish I brought this or <laughs> I, way, I brought way too much stuff, you know. Yeah, well, so, that 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 happens. I mean, you just it depends on what you're sketching, yeah. and the, the mood of the day, or whatever. But uh, okay, let's see what uh, we got. Some more questions coming in. Oh, where do you source the Stillman's heavyweight paper sketchbook you reference? So uh, I get mine at uh, Wet Paint, but you can order them online. And at the end of this, I'll be putting. Uh, I'll I'll send this to Steve, but I've got a discount code. For free shipping at Wet Paint right Perfect. now. If you uh, if you're watching these video for anybody, there's some rules around it. Anybody in the contiguous 48, and and as long as it's not oversized, you know, Great. it's just a regular. But they have a full stock of both the Stillman and Burn hard covers and the Stillman and Burn the new Stillman and Burn soft covers. By the way, Stillman and Burn uh, Wet Paint. Uh, none of these places pay us to talk about their stuff. It's right, right. It's just our experience. No at all on this yeah no uh yeah, but I've, yeah good question yeah i've 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 seen stillman and burn sketchbooks at barnes and noble yeah not that i'm recommending you buy them there but uh i've i've ordered most of mine through amazon um i think our local our we have a real small local art supply shop they have some but one thing uh, you're not going to see at like hobby lobby or walmart are the higher end sketchbook books right. the animule the stillman and burn but for a nice utilitarian sketchbook, you can get the Canson XL. You can pick that up at Walmart, Hobby Lobby, just about anywhere. Hobby Lobby, as a matter of fact, has some Strathmore uh, 400 series sketchbooks that aren't, aren't, aren't too bad. Yeah, very true. Um, here's a quick one I can answer. Have you ever gotten paint by one brand that doesn't mix well with other brands? No, not so far. Uh, not Doesn't mean they don't exist, but I have never. You, um, if, they, if it's in the same medium, like I had some per person tell me uh, uh, the other day they were having trouble with their their paints mixing, and I come to find out after some investigative uh, questioning that they were using 
a two tubes of gouache and three tubes of watercolor. Oh yeah. It doesn't yeah. work. It's just not going to work out. That no, way. not, but it, it looks will. the same, you know, yeah. it's the same manufacturer. You got to look, read the fine print. And you can sometimes finagle it and mix it on a palette. Um, but you need to kind of pre-mix it. It doesn't work. Like you said, it doesn't work when you get it down on your, on your surface very well. Sure. So we're getting a lot of good questions here. Uh, best waterproof fountain pen ink. I use uh, Noodler's Bulletproof Black. Um, it takes a long time to dry. That was recommended to me by, uh, I'm probably going to slaughter his name, Toichi. Toichi, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's Noodler's it's Black uh, will eventually dry. The problem is if you're out in the field and you want to watercolor right away, you may have to wait, wait a little bit. Uh, if Carbon, because it has to dry, you mean? Uh, yeah, it, it has okay. to dry. Um, platinum carbon is another one. Um, although it's it's rated safe for fountain pens, but it uh, it will you have to watch your pen. You know, you sure. have to clean your pen out every now and then. And uh, platinum actually makes a carbon a pen specifically for carbon ink, but it dries faster and it is waterproof. So that's a couple of them. And I'm going to seem like uh, maybe a little bit of a, a militant on this subject, but here's the the pen, the pen that I use most often. This is a Stedler. It's a pigment liner. It's made in Germany. I don't know why, but for some reason, Steve, all my favorite art supplies seem to come from Deutschland. Yeah, hold that up again. I had I didn't have you on full screen. Let me show you here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I like those too. They're pretty nice, and the tips are... I find them to be a little bit more durable than the Copics. Okay. Copics are really good ink, but these tips are tend to be durable. Now, How one do they, thing that, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. How do they uh, match up against the Pigma Microns? They're they're comparable. I would okay. say they're they're pretty comparable. Here's a list of sort of the uh, you can see there some of the qualities of this particular uh, pen. One thing I, I do want to say with the Copics that they have a distinct advantage over some of these other pens. You can refill them and change the tips really, really economically. If you make oh. the investment initially in the pen, okay. you can pretty much refill it. So, yeah. yeah. Do either of you use a light pad? I do. Uh, in fact, I've done two reviews of the uh, uh, Hueyon light pad, a big one and a small one. I use it for transferring. Uh, my drawings and studies and sketches to the final watercolor paper. How about you, Marty? You use a light pad? I don't use a light pad, but my wife uses it in her stained glass discipline. Ah, yeah. She uses a white pad to draw out her patterns and stuff, yeah. and she does some stained glass work. So I, 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 I see it there, and I think to myself, do I need that? And then I think <laughs> to myself, I probably don't. You see this thing I got from Norway? It's a big, giant, old-school uh, drafter's table. Yeah. This is how I started my career as a draftsman on a board, and then okay. we eventually went to CAD system. But is that a bridge? I, that wood th thing? This is, yeah. I made this myself. Yeah, you yeah. knew that. Yeah, you yeah. recognize that. But uh, I, um, I, I love this thing, man. I, it's one of the greatest things <laughs> I own. It's heavier than crap because it's all oak on the bottom, yeah. but it's well built. And I got these antique lights here, so. I, you know, this is pretty much where I, I, I do some more of my serious or longer term work. Sure. Well, I mean, something like that, it, it's just an inviting place to come and do art. I think it's, yeah. it's great to have. And I feel like, like I'm in like a, an old drafter here, you know, working on the Titanic uh, drawings or something, you know, some <laughs> sometimes and it's just fun. It's just yeah. Fun. Yeah. Oh, uh, let's see. If you see something you want to answer, just shout out, Marty. I'm looking. Well, oh, somebody, Lynn Wyant said that she made her own light pad for six bucks. I love people who, who can do that and have that skill. They can upcycle things, and, and uh, I think that's a really good way to do it because it teaches you so much if you have to build yeah. something yourself, right? That's right. Uh, for art prints, do you prefer to scan your art or photograph it? I scan it if it's small enough to fit on my scanner. Otherwise, I photograph it. And I'll even take uh, pieces that I can scan in two pieces or two parts 
and scan that because I've I got some Photoshop skills. I got a few. Yeah, and so you I can have some stitch skills. them together and usually make it look. A, my scanner is better than you know photographing them. Although I I've got a setup where I can do a pretty good photo if the prints from that art are not going to be too big. Uh, probably if I was ever going to do something, if I did a large, really large painting and I was going to do really large prints, uh, I might get it professionally scanned. But uh, I try to. I try to scan it before, you know, I try to photograph it. So is Mrs. Mitchell helping you out today in the chat room? Uh, she's not really helping. She's just observing and, and she, I adding, think she color, you made adding, a adding color commentary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank God my wife's not on because I, she's a very fine cusser and, you know, her Irish roots. But uh, so <laughs> what, 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 she said you made a coffee table once. Yeah, the two by fours. Two by fours, yeah. That's the one she's talking about. Is it when you were first married? When we were out? first yeah, married, yeah. 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 You but remember it, those old utility? They used to have the old uh, the the spools you yeah. roll up cable on. We oh, used yeah. to just turn those over in college, right? It's a great table. It is. There's a right? coffee shop. There's a coffee shop not far from here that has yeah. tables with, of those. Reminds me the of that. really big ones. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Get, you get like six, eight people around there. And, yeah, it's a good time. Uh, there's a question, Marty. How about you take that? What is a bridge for? Oh, well, uh, the bridge for me is so that I don't mark up my work. So I'll maybe I can show it here a little bit. I, I'd have to move some stuff. But, yeah, I'll just quick demonstrate. So I've got some. I've got a drawing here, and I'll move the bridge down, and I, I can lean my hand against it. Can everybody see this okay? I'll lean my hand against it, and then I'll be, and then I don't get my forearm on my work. Uh, I don't know how you use it, Steve, but that's essentially how mm -hmm. I use it. Yeah, pretty much the same way. I don't. Uh, I have a couple different ones that I use for lining with a brush. Uh, this one uh, was actually for an airbrush back in my airbrush days. So when you um, want to do careful work, right? Yeah, you can. Yeah. You can take and uh, above the surface you can actually do straight lines with a brush oh, but sure. you can also i actually made one well here's here's the one i have it's a portable version yeah of what you've got yeah exactly and that's, that's exactly this that. is more for for hand resting like yours yeah <laughs> some people are very elaborate like uh there was an old guy at our uh, an old draftsman uh, when i started out that had carpet on his you know and oh, a little yeah. bit of foam padding, you know, for, yeah. the, to, for yeah. arm fatigue. But, yeah, I just I, – that's what I use it for. And it, it, it moves a little. Mine does. People have elaborate s setups. I'm not, I'm not that fancy or, yeah. or uh, ingenious, but I like that. Uh, Puffy Joe asks, what's the best way to store a soft eraser, the one that you stretch? I just keep them out uh, wherever it's clean. Yeah. I, I try to not, not to put them in – I assume you're talking about these. Yeah, you could um, do a whole show on erasers. I did a video oh, once man. on all the erasers because <laughs> people, they're different for different people, you know, different techniques. They too. are. If is, you that, have a, is that the one you use the most, Steve? Um, yeah. I uh, When I'm drawing on watercolor paper, um, I keep it light, and then I just uh, use these to gently pick up, um, you know, the pencil. Some people don't like to draw directly on the watercolor paper. I, I don't mind it. Um, maybe that's probably due to experience. Uh, but if you, if you draw and erase a lot, you don't want to do it. Um, right. so I draw enough. I either transfer the drawing if it's something I really had to work out yeah. or I'll draw directly if it's just a loose drawing right on the watercolor paper. And then I'll just lightly, you know, kind of lift this if I want to yeah. lighten it or you can, another trick is you can, uh, roll this out into a little bit of a, a roll and then just roll it yeah that's on right. your paper and that will lighten your pencil yeah if you're trying to lighten it so well, one tip I like to give uh, new artists and they ask me about this all the time is like I've drawn a line I've tried to erase it and there's still a faint remnant of the line there yeah and rather than work that way I just try to turn the paradigm around for them because one of my art teachers taught me always start out light yeah. As light as you can. Start as yeah. light as you can. Even if you're doing searching lines, 
start out light because if you erase them, then they won't be visible. If you start out hardcore right from the get-go, yeah. those lines are still going to be visible as you try to erase them. That's so right. And I've gotten to the point where I don't mind a little bit of line showing. And you'll see a lot of watercolor work like that. Um, That's a whole technique right there. Yeah, just leaving a little bit of... Right. A here's, a good here's a good question, something we should have probably covered. What's your opinion on Canson paper? Uh, I love the new Canson Heritage. I really like the paper. It is an easy lifter. It lifts easier than a lot of papers I've used. Talk uh, about what is lifting, Steve? Lifting is just once the paint is down and has dried, or really it may even still be damp, but mostly after it's dried, you can re-wet it and lift the pigment back up. Uh, to lighten an area, to, to scrub it off a little bit. Um, now, you know, in the case of Canson Heritage, and uh, I recently, you know, did a painting and a review of that, it, I was, it kind of took me by surprise, uh, and it lifted a little easier, so my glazing was a little bit too wet. I had to dry my glazing a bit. Uh, so it's sort of a preferential how you paint kind of a thing, but it yeah. was a wonderful, wonderful paper. Prior to them coming out with Heritage, which is their new paper, the Mont du Roy, I think is their top grade, and it's fine. Yeah. It's a great paper. It's yeah. another one I just forgot to mention. Okay, um, yeah, Rob, Rob Norris is asking about uh, the XL multimedia paper. Is it useful as watercolor paper? I'll let you speak to that. I use it in the field sometimes yeah. too, so go ahead. It's one of those cheap papers that uh, is difficult to paint on. Um, again, it depends on your painting style, how you paint. Um, if if you're comfortable painting on it, if you're experienced enough, a beginner usually, and this is this is the irony, a beginner is going to probably that that is just now learning how to control their water and their paint is going to have trouble with it. Okay, and that's the that's the shame because it's sold as a as a low cost cheap beginner paper, uh, yeah. but there is a there's a real a real divide there I think. And I use it because I can do marker work on it, but I don't use it for serious work. I, I I'm hesitant to say serious work because I don't do a lot of that. But it's just a good for multimedia sketching. paper, I think, don't you? Yeah, I, I can get marker on it. I can get. Uh, you know, even a little bit of watercolor doesn't bother it. It will pill up after a while if you uh, if you uh, work it too much. But somebody's asking, oh, I know who this is. This is my friend Rhonda. She wants to know about scrubbing, and could you explain scrubbing? Scrubbing is just uh, a more aggressive form of lifting. Um, I have a video on lifting uh, you, on my channel somewhere, so you, you can go check that out. But there are grades, I would say, of lifting. There's the brush that you paint with, which is usually, uh, let me change this full screen order. There's the brush that you paint with, which once the paint dries, you can go back and, and gently re-wet and then yeah. dry out your brush and kind of soak it up. Uh, the next grade I would consider is a bristle oil the type of bristles that you normally use for oil painting. Oil brush, yeah. yeah. And this starts to abrade the paper a little bit. Yes. But it's a little more aggressive. It usually is still pretty gentle. Um, and then uh, from that, you go to a literal scrubber, which uh, a scrubber is stiff like a toothbrush. Yeah. Very abrasive. And you don't, you can't do this unless you have really good paper. Um, Arches takes it fine, um, even the 140 pound, but especially the, the 300 pound. I mean, you can literally just about ga gouge a hole out of your paper, and, and sure. still the problem is that on cheap paper, yeah, when you when you lift and scrub, um, and you go back af and after that's dry, and you go back to paint in it, you'll end up with a mess. With a good oh, quality sure. cotton paper. After scrubbing, usually uh, you can paint over it and you won't be able to see where you scrub if, if you've gotcha. not been too terribly grace, uh, uh, aggressive with it. So yeah. that's all scrubbing is, is a form of lifting. Good. What was the paper that uh, you got from Hobby Lobby, Steve? That was Annette Hansen asked that question. Uh, you're talking about the Arches paper? 
Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think you mentioned that you use your coupon on your cell phone. Yeah, forty percent um, off or something. A lot like of times they will have sales on their their pad paper. Yeah, at forty to fifty percent off. But if not, you can get a, a Hobby Lobby app, and you can get forty percent off of any one purchase every day. Yeah, um, just one purchase. But uh, so a lot of times uh, I will. This is my practice paper. Sure. So it's it runs about. Well, twenty dollars the full price. I get it for forty coupon gets off. It's, to twelve. Yeah, it's around around twelve. Twelve. Pretty good deal. Twelve and thirteen. So Sally Franklin asked this question earlier, and I want to make sure because uh, I saw it go by and nobody answered it. But uh, question: What is the best way to store your watercolor paper if you don't have a flat file? And I don't. Uh, I don't have room for a flat pile. I just have it in portfolio, uh, kind of a two boards. Yeah, like this, and I've got it all in there. Um, yeah, stacked vertically. Doesn't hurt it. Yeah, I so. mean, and if you and if and if you're not that uh, motivated to get sort of that board, you could also use cardboard. I I do that with the little draftsman. There's drafters yeah. tape. I got a roll of it somewhere around here, but drafters tape lets you tape, and the tape comes right back off. But it holds the, it it'll, it'll hold uh, hold paper down. So. Uh, but I'm lucky. I have a flat file, Steve. I, it's junky right now. I'm nice. to show you, but nice. let's go ahead. At some point, as a draftsman, I invent. I invested in this massive flat file right here. <laughs> Let me tell oh, you, my son and I had a hell of a time hauling this thing down the I steps. I bet. I bet. Because <laughs> it's heavy. But yeah, the flat file, if you can, sometimes you can find them on Craigslist, and they don't. Um, they're not that expensive. But uh, mine's almost jam full. But I've got like. A whole drawer full of special watercolor paper yeah. in here that I nice. Uh, I'd yeah. love to have one. I'd love to have the room for one. Yeah, right. You've got your yeah. your studio's on the small side, and I was thinking maybe Rita could, uh, you know, you could migrate into the living room or something. <laughs> She'd love that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think her her spinning like her spinning and dying is expanding faster than than my painting. <laughs> Uh, here's a good question. Here's a good question. What is gouache, and what is the difference between Very gouache good. and watercolor? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Uh, well, it's just a opaque watercolor. It's it's uh, thicker, chalkier, and very opaque, uh, depending on the, the brand. Uh, Windsor Newton has a really good one. Uh, M. Graham has a really good one. There's some cheaper brands that are a little less uh, opaque and probably. Uh, a little less light fast i guess um yeah, but it is, is a, for all practical purposes it's considered a watercolor that's a painting that was done with with gouache by a friend uh, of mine a comic book artist named jay woodward jk woodward and nice. uh, yeah it's a very nice gouache painting but you can see how it's very opaque you know yeah, so yeah. yeah and whereas watercolor be as you said transparent. and you can you can actually use uh gouache in a kind of a watercolory way I don't, since you brought up comics uh illustrator alex ross yeah uses gouache yeah right, and when right. you look at it it kind of looks like watercolor it doesn't look like gouache but if you look carefully you can see where he's used it to opacity it used um, to I, be like a uh like a you know a illustrator like a board storyboard sort yeah. of uh medium yeah. right yeah. right it, okay. it did um it was used as uh, an animation for backgrounds a lot. Uh, it's, it's, I, I had some good friends who were illustrators in, in the area. They still are. They yeah. used to do a lot of children's books and uh, did some work for Disney, and they used gouache almost exclusively. Uh, it gets a nice, uh, in an airbrush, it gives a nice flat, uh, rich color. Um, but, yeah, yeah. That's uh, yeah. and and there are painters that use it with watercolor. You just have to, as as you mentioned before, Marty, you have to be careful. Sure. Um, it, you kind of have to use one or the other, not mix them too much. Yeah, there's a question here. I want to. Uh, so there's a guy, I believe. Uh, let me see. No, it's it's a gal. I think so. Sherry Gallant. She says she comes from an oil painting background. She's looking for something to put. On watercolors, so I can paint over it in glazes. 
I, I take that to mean she wants to understand how glazing works in mm -hmm. watercolors. Can you ad address that, Steve? Yeah. Um, That's a good one. Uh, they're basically you just have to seal the watercolor, and it kind of depends on how what surface you prefer to paint on. But uh, by that I mean how many layers of the sealer you build up and what you do. There's an illustrator, and I'm not gonna be able to remember her name. It just kind of left me. She used to do a lot of her underpaintings in watercolor, but she would do them on illustration board oh, and sure. uh, and do a full tonal understudy or underpainting, a grisaille, if you want the academic word. Yes. And uh, then she would take Krylon crystal clear and seal it like multiple times. So uh, I don't know, probably five, six, seven, eight times until she had this completely plastic like surface over the top of it. And then she would use oil glazes on top of that. She would do these, she did a style, man, I wish I could think of her name. She did a style that looked very Renaissance like, like the old Renaissance paintings you would see in a sure. museum. Yeah. And she kind of, kind of brought that style, um, you know, back to, to life, you might say, but there are another number of ways you can seal um paintings uh, uh there are some good golden has some really good acrylic varnishes but usually what i would do is seal it first so it doesn't re-wet the, the watercolor and then paint with a brush uh the acrylic varnish on top of that you can get uv versions of it if you want and then you have uh acrylic makes a pretty decent sure. base for painting you can even get clear gesso that has tooth to it. Okay. So, so that's how you glaze right now, Steve. I no I no no. She's video. talking about oil on top of watercolor. Oh yeah, because that I'm you're confused. I was confused there because uh, yeah, glazing. No. You don't have to do all that for glazing. No watercolor. Oh. You just it's just layer over on layer on layer. But, right. But there are some, you know, uh, people will do various types of underpaintings. Uh, sure. With either watercolor or acrylic. With acrylic, you don't really need to do much. You can, you know, especially since with acrylic, you can usually paint on a canvas and whatnot. As uh, the and in the oil painting, she's there's you know it's confusing because you got the the fat on lean principle there and right you know and right. when you're glazing, you get to very thin, thin, uh, thin, thin layers. layers. Yeah. But if you tried to if you tried to glaze oil over a watercolor on paper that hadn't been sealed uh the for one thing the oil is going to soak right into the paper and for another thing you know who knows what it's going to do to the to the color and tones of the watercolor yeah. so it has to be sealed and uh and then i usually would put a I, I did a few portraits this way uh for some people i would put a like a varnish on top of that that's several spray coats of sealer and then uh a, brush on varnish or like a clear gesso clear acrylic gesso gotcha um i was i was gonna say that uh gourmet tray asked a question here uh that i think i can answer what do you think is better for a day trip tube or solid cake watercolor obviously i take the cakes with me because then i don't have to worry about actually the tubes way more than the pans and for me um bringing the tubes with me creates the nuisance of, I don't know if I'm going to sit down and <laughs> on one of the tubes and it's going to fly open or, you know, these, I just don't have to worry about. And they're just easy. The other thing is I can just use a water pen with these, you know, with the tube, I have to constantly, cause I put too much out, then I have to rinse my brush constantly. So yeah. I can, if you just want a travel kit, I recommend you get no. a cake, but no, okay. no. And you can, it, depending on the paint you have, if you've got a palette, an empty travel palette, you might be able to fill them with tubes uh, and uh, let them dry. So essentially you have a pan, but you got to be careful because some brands dry from a tube, dry yes. too hard, crack and fall out. That's right. Um, so Daniel Smith is a good one. Well, Daniel Smith and M. Graham are the two paints uh, and I guess an Ilier from the tube. Are the ones I've mixed in a couple of pans in here, and they seem to work fine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, somebody was telling me once maybe honey-based 
paints won't won't work as well, but they just stay moist a little longer to my uh, from my testing. Well, let's take maybe a couple more, and then I think we're gonna probably need to end it. What is your favorite really white paper? I would say mine is the Arches Bright White. They have a natural white and a bright white, so that would yeah. be that would be mine. Yeah, and I think I use the the Bristol. Uh, well, because it's multimedia and I'm doing a lot of pencil ink work, I I use like a um, is it a Stonehenge Bristol paper? Yeah. Bright oh white, yeah. Bright white. It works works pretty good for an illustrator anyway. Sure. I kind of sure. like bright paper, but then I got a friend of mine named Stuart Lockridge who's a great painter, and he just uses all kinds of toned papers, you know, and and he can get great effects on those, even with watercolor. And I struggle with watercolor on toned paper. It seems to knock it down into kind of a, a muted yeah. color. But it uh, does. It does. Yeah. So yeah, gouache is great on toned paper. Yeah. I'm have to try that. Uh, let's see. Uh, do 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 do. <laughs> Six Sigma. Yeah, I sat through enough Six Sigma meetings. I'm done with that. That's corporate stuff. Um. I did want to mention a couple of things, Steve, if, if I have a second here. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank Valerie for, I basically told her, I asked her last night, I said, Val, can you, can you come and moderate the, the chat room yep. for us tomorrow? And she said, oh, sure, I'll do it. Yeah. So she's awesome. Definitely. Thanks yeah. so much, Val. Appreciate That's it. That's pretty cool. Let's have more um, work than people know. Yes, exactly. And then a uh, cup to address, you know, some people that dropped by my channel and have said that, Boy, I sure wish you and Lindsay and Steve would do something together. We did something together last year, and I think Lisa Klo from Lockery Arts was with us, and you can go and find that video out mm -hmm. uh, on, I think it's Lindsay's channel. But in case you are, that's not the last of the collaborations, and this certainly isn't. We'll do more. Yeah. And so, yeah, I asked Lindsay yeah. if she yep. wanted to do one, and she said she was, she was down, so, so we can do that as well. Yeah, Lindsay's turning into a superstar. She's going to get to that untouchable stage one of these days. <laughs> I know. We'll be, I'll have to do a media, a media request to get her time. Hey, That's by true. the way, speaking of superstars, um, your channel has got almost 100,000 subscribers, man. Yeah, it's getting close. What it's the heck? Getting close. <laughs> That's amazing. It's, it's funny because um, it's like, it's kind of like watching paint dry. You know, you, <laughs> no, when not you're, at all. When you're back around 20, 30, 40,000, you know, you, you rack up subscribers here, rack up subscribers there, and you don't pay a lot of attention. But one, when it turned to 90, I thought, oh, we're on the final stretch. You know, I told my wife, we're on, we're on 100K watch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and it's like watching paint dry. You know, it's like, I mean, that's there's enough. Another people hundred, to there's I'm another hundred. <laughs> I mean, that's a city's worth of people that have subscribed and thought to themselves, you know what? I'm going to go ahead. Yeah. I love what Steve's doing. And I think that's fantastic, Steve. And, you know, well, I, you. I, I'm happy to say I was one of the early uh, mind of, minders. Uh, it was you, me, and Reese back in the old days, uh, yes. Steve, and <laughs> just hanging out. But uh, once you get a collection of videos uh, like Steve has now on his channel, I always recommend people go out binge watch the channel. I mean, start start from the beginning because it's like it's like watching a great show and and you've developed over the years, Steve. You yeah. you're, you you you've developed your technique. You've done some things to change uh, the way you do your videos. You've added better equipment over time. Things have yeah. improved, but it's yeah. really cool to go back and see where you came from to where you are now. And yeah. and you're so entertaining, Steve. I well, well thank you. <laughs> It's one of my favorite things to do is just go and watch your channel and I'll, I'll just turn it on and watch it for an hour. Appreciate that, Marty. You know, I just yep. try to be myself. I thought that's the only thing I can be. I, you know, if I pretend to be anything else, uh, you know, three weeks, two months, six months later, I'm not going to remember what I thought I was. So that's right. I always remember what I really am. So <laughs> try to just be myself, but. Well, Thank you. you do, very, very kind of you to say those things. Well, you do great at it. I, uh, I, I like sending people over your way. And whenever I get a watercolor question on the channel or in the comments, I always say, go talk to Steve Mitchell because he is the mind of watercolor. And they, <laughs> they, sure. they usually know exactly what I'm talking about. But 
wanted to say hello to a few friends who joined today, Steve, if that's okay, quick. You go right ahead, my friend. Uh, my friend Anya Muir, Rhonda McGee, she stopped by. I know she asked some questions. Yeah. Shannon, Shannon Sand, she's been a big channel supporter of mine from the beginning. Eve Bolt, Kate, the sleepy teacher, Jane Kirkwood, who's also a friend of mine on, on Facebook. She's awesome. And Denise Chappelle, um, Denise, Denise lives in Michigan, and she's always – I know she watches my videos because she'll mention something from the end of the video. And you, you can tell, you know, like people ask you a question. It's like, hey, did you actually watch the video? But Denise always asks me great questions because she watches the whole, the whole video, <laughs> which I appreciate. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, my buddy Patrick, a.k.a. Super Flawless Number 9. He's been a subscriber think, since I think he was 12, 11 or 12 years old, Steve. And today, this week, he graduates high school. Nice. That's how nice. long I've been on YouTube, brother. So, <laughs> it's been, oh wow, it's been a good ride. I just wanted yeah. to shout out to those yeah. guys and thank them for coming yeah. by and helping to support you and and this collaboration today. All right. Well, with that, I think we'll probably call it quits. Thank you to everybody so much for tuning in, and thank you for uh, making both of our channels something that uh, Marty and I both look forward to doing. Yeah. Uh, the questions you ask, the things that you want to learn, watching the light bulb come on for some of you guys is such great motivation. Thank you all for subscribing, liking, watching, all that great stuff. And hopefully we'll do this again real soon. So Yeah, and as a treat, go down in the description of the video here, and I'll leave a discount code for you for, for our good friends over at Wet Paint where you can pick your own art supplies. Uh, hopefully you'll use it on Schmenka because uh, they got a brand new stock of in and some great colors, but cool. discount code right down here. I wish we had a store around here like wet paint. <laughs> All you got to do, Steve, is get in your car, drive 30 hours, <laughs> come up and see me, brother. That's you got right. a place to stay. That's right. All right. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I'm going to try to list uh, a lot of supplies that we talked about. Inevitably, I'll probably forget some, but uh, you'll be able to get links to those as well. And we will see everybody in the next video. Let's do it again. All right.